This week on the Q&A podcast, journalist and historian Craig Fairman analyzes American presidents through the lens of the books they've written. This program originally aired in February of 2020. People often think C-SPAN is funded by the federal government. In fact, we're a nonprofit organization that receives no government funding. As news consumption changes, you can help ensure the future of C-SPAN's unfiltered coverage of national government and politics. We hope you will consider making a tax-deductible contribution that will support our daily editorial operations. To learn more, visit c-span.org donate. Craig Furman, author of the new book, Author in Chief. Who was Orrin Follett? And why did he make the claim that he made Abraham Lincoln president? Orrin Follett um, was a publisher in Ohio. And so he had a small printing firm um, in Ohio. They published lots of different local books. But he had the distinct privilege of being the person to publish Abraham Lincoln's best-selling book. I guess we should probably back up a little bit because most people don't know that Abraham Lincoln wrote a best-selling book. I certainly didn't know it before I started working on my book. But when Lincoln ran for the Senate and lost to Stephen Douglas, they had their famous debates. And so during the debates, there was always a couple people from newspapers who were um, transcribing the debates, writing them down in shorthand, and then the next day or a couple days later, they would be printed in newspapers so people who didn't attend could read about what had happened. Now, for most people, the story stopped there. You know, this is breaking news. Okay, it's broken. Let's all move on. On. But Lincoln, after he lost the Senate race, worked really hard to gather those newspaper transcripts. And I mean, he worked really hard. There are at least nine surviving letters of him in the weeks after the Senate race gathering these newspaper transcripts. And what he then did is he cut them out column by column and pasted them in a scrapbook. And you can still see this scrapbook today at the Library of Congress. It's an amazing document because Lincoln is making these tiny little edits in pencil. He's, you know, if one paragraph from one newspaper isn't quite accurate, he's cutting it out putting in a different paragraph in its place. So this book contained more than 100,000 of Lincoln's words, nearly as many of Stephen Douglas's, and Lincoln created this perfect version of their debates, or, or at least the most perfect that you could do in 1858 before TVs and recording devices. So then Lincoln went and tried to find a printer. This wasn't easy because Lincoln was not a, a prominent national figure at this point. He was just somebody who lost a race for Senate. But he finally, with the help of some Ohio Republicans, connected with Mr. Follett. And they brought the book out in 1860. And it was an enormous bestseller. It sold 50,000 copies, which is a big number any time, but especially in 1860 is, is a huge number. If you adjust it by population, it's the equivalent of a book selling half a million copies today. And so this book came out in time to help Lincoln become the Republican nominee for president. And then it became even more popular when he actually ran for president. Newspapers would constantly cite it. Voters would write Lincoln letters about it. When people would ask Lincoln, well, what do you think about this issue? He would say, why don't you just look at my book? So this book was essential to circulating his ideas and to really legitimizing him as a candidate. When the first reviews came out, they would say things like, here's the book from Stephen Douglas and Abram Lincoln. They couldn't even get his name right. But that book, people started to learn his name correctly and people started to learn his ideas. And it played a huge role, an overlooked role, but a huge role in lifting him to the White House. So that's what led to, to Follett's quip. He ended up visiting Lincoln after he won the presidency, and when he walked into the, uh, walked into the room to meet with Lincoln, he said, you know, uh, Lincoln said, it's good to see you. And Follett said, well, you know, it should be. After all, I'm the person who helped make you president. And all Lincoln could do was smile, but I think Lincoln appreciated it. One, one of my favorite Lincoln letters is right after he hears that, that, that Follett is gonna publish the book. And Lincoln said, this is the greatest compliment I've ever received, that, that somebody wants to publish my book. And, and that's because Lincoln was a book lover. So this is just one story that's in your new book, Author-in-Chief. Tell me about the concept for the book. Sure, so it's the, the untold story of presidents and their books. And one thing I think that's really fun and surprising is that this is a history that's as long as American history itself. I talk about two different kinds of books in the, in the book. There are campaign books like Lincoln's where somebody is running for the White House and they use a book to help. And then there are legacy books, which after the White House, somebody writes about, you know, what did I do in the White House? What, what did my enemies say? What do I say? That kind of thing. And just as an example of how old this history is, the first campaign book, that comes from Thomas Jefferson. The first legacy book, that comes from John Adams. So this is just a really deep history, and it's a brand new angle on the presidency. When I started working on this book 10 years ago, I had to start by making a list because nobody had written about this before. You know, how many books are there even out there that fit into this rubric? 
and there were a lot, and they were books that really made a difference. So what is, in your mind, is the value of judging a president or a presidency by his writing? Well, I think there are a couple things. First of all, it, it, it reminds us of how what history felt like, not just to presidents, but to regular people. Um, sometimes I think we forget about this because we live in an age where there are lots of different media, including you know television shows like the ones we're on. But when Lincoln was running for president, books and newspapers were popular culture. They were the mass media. And so when you think about a book helping somebody run for the White House, that's, you know, that also tells you something about what it was like to be alive as a presidential candidate or as a voter. It's a really uh, distinctly human angle on, on these big issues. But I also think it helps because it shows a human side of the presidents. There's just something about writing, and this applies to writing an email as much as writing a book, that if you try to put your thoughts or your feelings into words, you have to slow down. You have to think, you know, what am I afraid of? What am I scared of? What do I want? And that's true for presidents, just like it's true for the rest of us. So again and again, when I would look at presidents sort of taking their time and slowing down and working on these books, and, and I tried to go behind the scenes and really find those details, I felt like I was finding even our most well-known presidents at their most human. Before we start digging into your research and your book, there's a Craig Furman story here that's pretty interesting. Uh, how did this all get started for you? So it was back in 2008. Um, I was in graduate school at the time. And Where was that? That was at Yale. I was working on a PhD in English. And so I was in graduate school, but I was also spending a lot of time going to you know, Politico's website and clicking refresh because it was, a, it was an election year and it was a really exciting election. And what I noticed is that books were making a big difference. Barack Obama's books were everywhere. John McCain's books were everywhere. These books were really uh, making an impact. And I guess I just got curious and I thought, had this happened before? Is this, you know, it feels special, it feels new, but is it? And so I started digging in and what I found was that history is so much deeper than I expected. As I mentioned, it, it goes way back, and there are so many books that have had a huge impact, that have lifted people to the White House, that have given them a chance to you know, ma make a memorable case for their legacy. And so it took me 10 years uh, because there was a, a lot of groundwork to lay to be, even be able to write a book like this because there, there weren't precedents. But I also tried to really do research on, into the cultural side of things. So I always like to say that if you love reading history books, this book will tell you the history of yourself because there's material about, you know, what was Calvin Coolidge's favorite bookstore? How did a printing press work when Abraham Lincoln was president? And I think those kinds of quick little stories remind us about how American culture works and, and remind us about how important books have been to our country. What happened to the PhD? Uh, it's, my mom would really want me to say that it's still in progress, and so that's <laughs> what I will defer to her. It's still in progress. Uh, when, at what point in your research did you say, wow, there's a book here? It happened pretty quickly. I, that 2008 election, I was curious, but I didn't start digging carefully into it until the next year in 2009. And that's when you know I would go to really good research libraries and, and get in those card catalogs and just say, like, let's look up John Quincy Adams by his last name. How many books are there by John Quincy Adams? And so making that list, it, it was astonishing how many books there were and, and how many strange books. Herbert Hoover wrote a mining textbook. Who knew? Um, but also, there were these really intimate books and these really important books. And I, I started to realize that, you know, Abraham Lincoln, Calvin Coolidge, Ulysses S. Grant, Jefferson, Adams, um, there were so many examples of these books really mattering. And, and that's when I started to realize there's a story to tell here. Your book is also, uh, and you alluded to this, the history of nonfiction book publishing sure. in America. Uh, why do you tell that part of the story as well? Well, I think it's important because that's what helps us realize how important these books have been. Even if you read a good biography about a lot of the presidents I talk about, their books don't come up very much. Their books aren't central. And that's because I think um, biographers and historians, they, they have a lot of work to do. You know, they're worrying about the White House and the policies and the legislative debates. And, and my book's not too much about that. My book is about the human side and, and about the, the publishing side and running for office. Um, so without that context, you can't realize how important these books are. I'll give you an example from Lincoln since we were talking about him. When Lincoln's book came out, it was a bestseller because people cared, because slavery was a huge issue that everybody wanted to know where the candidates stood. But it was also a bestseller because of steam-powered engines. I mean, trains were finally uh, widely available, and it was a lot easier to move a book from one city to another by train. Before there were trains, you had to move them by horseback or in horse carriage, and, and books are heavy. So if you want somebody to deliver a book by mail, they're not going to do it because there's only so much room in the saddlebag. So that helped, but then steam-powered engines also helped because of printing presses. Printing presses up to that point had been very, you know, very similar to what Gutenberg had done, just one person takes the arm and pulls. 
But in this period, printing presses started to be powered by steam engines, and that made it faster to make books, and that made books cheaper, and that made it easier for people to buy books. So those kinds of changes, I think, first of all, they're fun. Like if, if you like books and you want to know about the history of bookstores or books, I've got a lot of material about that because I just like that. I like books too. Um, but second, I think it really helps us appreciate how these books mattered in their own times. When did uh, readily available reading glasses become a factor in, in people reading? That was in the 19th century as well. And it's, I, I like those kinds of small details because you don't, you don't really think about them as a technology. But you know, oil lamps, reading glasses, those really matter because it's hard to huddle up next to a fireplace and read a book. Um, so the more light that you have to read by, the, the more you can read and, and the better reader you can be. I, I have one story that it's in a footnote, but it just really makes me laugh. Um, there was a pastor um, from a reader who lived in New York City. And this reader, by the way, he's such a fun character. He's somebody who decided, I'm only gonna read biographies for the next year. I love nonfiction. And this is in the, in the 19th century, but very similar to a lot of readers today. And so he goes to church and his pastor is up in front delivering a sermon and there's an oil lamp there and the pastor knocks the lamp over. A little bit of fire, a lot of, lot of chaos, a lot of disaster, the pastor's freaking out. And he just says, you know, what, what was wrong with the candle? Why, like, why didn't we just stick with candles? But, you know, candles, oil lamps, those are, those are technologies just like smartphones or anything else today. Yeah, everybody who's have ever had the darn internet expression is identifying with the candle and That's the well oil put, lamp. Yeah, yeah so you, you mentioned footnotes, and, and your book has about 60 pages of notes at the back of them mm. filled with stories like this. Mm -hmm. How did you do all of this research? Slowly. <laughs> it, it, it really took 10 years of work, and a lot of the work was that looking at the history of nonfiction publishing and, and figuring out how presidential campaigns work because there have been really important shifts in, in how you're able to run for president. So how did you support yourself during all this time? Uh, well, I lived in the Midwest for a lot of it, which helps because the cost of living was, was lower. Uh, my wife works, and, and she was a very patient woman, and uh, she's actually a book editor, and so she's a wonderful editor as well. And, you know, I, I was fortunate to get a really generous book deal. That helped. and. You know, we just made it work. There, there were, were not a lot of travels or, or, or fancy splurges while I was working on the book, but that's because I was working on the book. And I'm glad I did because I, it's my first book and I wanted it to be as good as I could possibly make it. What uh, for, among your research was uh, the biggest aha moment, your biggest discovery that you found along the way? Sure. Well, because I'm from the Midwest, my bias makes me want to say Lincoln, but we, we've talked a little bit about his book already and, and the fact that he wrote a bestseller. Another big aha for me actually came from Kennedy and the fact that he, you know, a lot of people have this vague sense that John F. Kennedy's Profiles in Courage was written by somebody else. And that, that's very true. And I sort of, I spent time at the Kennedy Presidential Library looking at thousands of pages of documents. And I really try to summarize that and, and show just how little work Kennedy did. But then I found this side, and, and again, it, it's a human side of, of how much Kennedy cared about the book. You know, he's a senator, he's a celebrity. Being an author, you, you wouldn't think that it was necessarily on the front of his mind, but it was. When his book, Profiles in Courage, came out, he would write his letter to, or his editor letters and say, hey, I was at the airport and I didn't see any copies of my book there. Can we fix that? Why, why would a senator notice something like that? But I think Kennedy really cared about, about being an author and, and seeing that side of him was really surprising to me. So as a first time author, what was it like picking up the Wall Street Journal recently and seeing a full page review, positive review of your book and it, with the conclusion, author in chief ends up being one of the best books on the American presidency to appear in recent years. Yeah, and, and a review written by Thomas Mallon, an author that I have great respect for. I'll be honest with you, I cried. I mean, I to work on something for 10 years and then to have it um, described in those terms and to have Mr. Mallon um, do a really great job summarizing what's in the book and, and he, you know, he loved the publishing side, he loved the presidential side, it meant the world to me. And it's also meant a lot that I've started my book tour and to talk to regular readers and have them resonate with it or have them tell me their favorite stories about um, presidents and their books. It's, it's, it's been a wonderful experience and I think the fact that it took 10 years to get there makes it all the sweeter. How many cities will you visit? Uh, 13, I believe, but there might be some more uh, down the road, especially in the Midwest, when I you know, visit some bookstores close to home. So before we dig into some of the individual stories, I wanted to run through a couple of quick facts. So which president wrote the most books? Probably Teddy Roosevelt. 
I, I, I don't know that I ever crunched the numbers specifically, but I can't imagine that anyone would do it other than, than Teddy Roosevelt because he was well over 30. It's a, it's a trickier question than you would think because you have to define what is a book. Is a pamphlet a book? Is a collection of speeches a book? But I feel pretty confident that it's Teddy Roosevelt, and if he were here with us, he would certainly be announcing that fact himself. Uh, this is a value judgment, but who was our most gifted presidential writer? I think it was probably Lincoln, um, just as a stylist, both in his speeches and in his book. But, but there are also some surprising presidents. Calvin Coolidge is an example that maybe even most history fans don't have his presidency right at the front of their mind. But he was such a talented writer. I found a New York Times article that in which they said Calvin Coolidge, and this was during his presidency, Calvin Coolidge is the best literary president since Lincoln. And, and that article meant something to Coolidge. He actually wrote a thank you letter from the White House to that author because it mattered to him. So you don't only talk about writing, you talk about presidents reading. Sure. Which, uh, which among our presidents were the most uh, uh, voracious readers? Well, first of all, we should say that a lot of them were really dedicated readers. And, and for a lot of them, books helped make them presidents today. Um, somebody like Ronald Reagan, somebody like Harold, or Harry Truman, it, it was their local libraries that really gave them that boost because their families were working class and so they couldn't go out and acquire a lot of books, but they had their libraries and that's where they first started getting ideas and, and first started thinking about history. But Harry Truman was probably the biggest lover of history um, in terms of reading. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant was one of the biggest fiction lovers, believe it or not. He read so many novels. He actually got demerits at West Point as a cadet because he was spending too much time in the library. But um, all that fiction reading, I think, helped make his presidential memoir a, a stunning book. On the converse side, President Trump often says that he doesn't have time to read many books. What other presidents were not readers? Um, Lyndon Johnson is a good example of somebody who was, was not much of a reader. His wife would sometimes joke that, you know, he hadn't read a book since he was in college in Texas. Um, I'm sure that's not true, but, you know, sometimes, I don't necessarily think that reading a book is the, is the most important thing that you can do as president. It's understandable that they're busy and that they have a lot going on, but certainly I value books and reading books on the way to the White House or taking some time to read, I think, can be a useful way to sort of step back from the, all the excitement, all the news that's happening around them. So Johnson and, and Trump, I think, are two good examples. So earlier you mentioned the two types of books, the legacy book and the campaign book. Mm -hmm. James Buchanan wrote a legacy book. How did, that, how did that help him? <laughs> it did not help him, but that's probably because nothing could help him. He was a, a, a terrible president. People realized it quickly. People in both the North and the South realized it. And I think that's one reason why he wrote the book, because he realized that, that this is, you know, the history is not going to look kindly on me and on the Civil War that's, that, you know, the groundwork for it was laid under my watch. Um, but still, he decided that he wanted to write a book. He tried to recruit some friends, and he would say, hey, I've got all my letters, I've got all my papers, why don't you come write this book defending me? He didn't get any takers, so he says, all right, I've got to do this myself. It's not a book that is very rewarding to read today. It's written in the third person um, because writing autobiography, just like running for president, has changed a lot over the course of American history, and I'm sure we can talk about some of the reasons for that. But because Buchanan didn't want to appear too arrogant, he wrote in the third person. So James Buchanan is writing, Mr. Buchanan did this, or Mr. Buchanan did that. And it grabs long chunks of documents from those papers. So there will be a little bit of writing and then a long, long document. But it was, even if he had been the best, the best writer in the world, I'm not sure it could have saved him. And the New York Times had a review that ran right after the book came out. And it said, you know, Buchanan, for some reason, he didn't wait for his enemies to write a book. He just wrote a book himself, and everything you need to attack him is right there in the book. Buchanan eventually just told his friends, stop sending me reviews. I don't, I don't want to read any more of this. Well, we're going to listen to a few clips during our conversation from C-SPAN's video library. The first one is a contemporary president, Bill Clinton, talking about the importance of writing an autobiography or a memoir. Let's, let's look. I have concluded from doing this book that everyone who's fortunate enough to live to be 50 should sit down at some point and write the story of his or her life, even if it's just for yourself, your children, your family members, because it's important what you remember, how you remember it, what you forget. It's important to try to come to terms with the life you've lived and to think about how you wish to spend whatever years are remaining. So I, everybody talks about how terrible this book writing is. I've enjoyed it, and I've written every word of this book. 
So he's arguing that everyone should do it. But when we think about presidents, what does the whole genre of presidential memoir do to the collection of history of that presidency? Where does it fit into how scholars judge? Sure. It, I kind of have to take it in two parts. When presidents write about their childhood or when they first fell in love with politics or first thought I could run for office, those passages, sometimes that's the only place that, that scholars can get that information. Um, in Harry Truman's memoirs, which were two volumes and a bestseller in their own day, uh, there's a wonderful story about his favorite high school history teacher. And you'll find that in every Truman biography, and that story comes right from Truman and his book himself. So the books are very valuable for those kinds of early formative years and those humanizing details. They become uh, less valuable the closer that we get to the, the times of real political power. That's when presidents start to sort of tell their own version, uh, use a little bit of spin, um, and, and that's when scholars really have to sift and evaluate what a president says versus what actually happened. But, but I would say there's value in seeing how somebody spins. If you see how they viewed themselves, you can understand a little bit more about what they were trying to accomplish at the time. And in my own book, if, if in those moments where I felt like the books were becoming uh, you know, very partisan or tendentious, that's when I tried to take readers behind the scenes. I, I can give you a good example, actually, from President Clinton's book. Um, his book, when it's on the White House, is, of course, a very pro-Clinton book. I mean, I don't know how we could expect it to be otherwise. But instead of sort of running through all the points that he made in my life, I tell the stories of how they were working on the book. And he did write the book himself. He's right, but he was late on the book. He, he was a procrastinator. And so at the end, they've got this book with millions of dollars writing on it. Bill Clinton's editor came to his house and slept on Bill Clinton's couch just to make sure he would hit the deadline. And I think stories like that can be as revealing as the books themselves. So, uh when did, he makes the point, as you said, of, that he wrote the book himself. When did ghostwriters become part of the picture, and and how should we understand uh, the the president's personality if someone else is writing his words? Sure. It's a really good and, and, and a, a really important question. Um, first, I'll just say that there are a lot of presidents who have not needed ghostwriters. President Obama is an example. Adams, Jefferson, Coolidge, Grant, Lincoln, Roosevelt, Wilson. There are lots of presidents who who did the work themselves. But I would push back and against the idea that, that a ghostwritten book is automatically inauthentic or automatically a, a poor book. I, I just don't think that's true. If we want to talk about the history of ghostwriting in America, we have to start with George Washington's farewell address. It's one of the foundational texts for our nation still today. Um, but when it came to the actual time for the writing, Washington got help. It was James Madison first and then especially Alexander Hamilton who helped him put the ideas into words. Now they were Washington's ideas they landed with such impact because they had Washington's name attached to them, and Washington was very involved in the process. He said, this is what I want the style to be. Um, I want to review the drafts. I might make some changes. It's Washington's speech, but he still got help writing it. And to me, the distinction I like to say is not, is a book ghostwritten or is a book not ghostwritten? I say, is it a good book? or a bad book. And, and with Washington's farewell address, that's an example of, of good ghostwriting and how the process can help. Let's spend a little bit more time on the JFK story. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a, another clip. This is from 1957. CBS, Mike Wallace, talking to columnist Drew Pearson about the JFK book. Let's watch. Sure. In your column on October 27th, you wrote that Senator Kennedy's, and I quote, millionaire McCarthyite father, crusty old Joseph P. Kennedy, is spending a fortune on a publicity machine to make Jack's name well known. No candidate in history, you wrote, has ever had so much money spent on a public relations advance buildup, end quote. Uh, Jack Kennedy's a fine young fellow, a very personable fellow, but he isn't as good as that public relations campaign makes him out to be. Uh, he's the only man in history that I know who won a Pulitzer Prize on a book which was ghostwritten for him. Pretty tough stuff there. So this is 1957, uh, before he sought the White House, but obviously aspirational. Were people debating this concept at the time after he'd won the Pulitzer Prize? Uh, the Pulitzer Prize was the turning point. And I, and I think that's really important to understand, um, both in the history of the book, but also just in terms of understanding Kennedy's psychology. So the book comes out in 1956, and over the course of that year, it's a hit. 
I mean, it's everything you could want a book to be. It's on the New York Times bestsellers list for weeks and weeks and weeks. It elevates Kennedy from being a senator from New England to being a national figure. In, uh, in 1956, that year at the Democratic Convention, Kennedy very nearly gets the vice presidential nomination, which was a big surprise. Uh, one story I tell in my book is that Kennedy had a meeting with Harry Truman, who at that point was an ex-president, but still important within the party's uh, infrastructure. And so Kennedy and Truman meet in Truman's hotel suite. Kennedy comes out, the reporters swarm. What did you guys talk about? And Kennedy says, my book. <laughs> that shows you that Harry Truman's a really good reader, but it also shows you how important Profiles in Courage was in 1956. So if the story stops there, I think it's a happy story. Yes, Kennedy had the book written by somebody else, and, and we can talk about the details behind that, but good ghostwriting and bad ghostwriting, right? This is an example of good ghostwriting. It's a book that really is moving a lot of people, and it's inspiring people because Kennedy is an inspirational figure. Where Things Change is with the Pulitzer Prize, which comes in 1957. And when I was working at the Kennedy Presidential Library, I found documents that for the first time show that Jack Kennedy himself was involved in securing that Pulitzer Prize. The story has often been, and you, could have, you saw it in that Pearson quote, that, that Kennedy's father was the one pulling the strings behind the scene. But that's not true. Jack Kennedy wanted that Pulitzer Prize. There are multiple times when he brought up the Pulitzer Prize. He told another historian, I'd rather win a Pulitzer Prize than be president. And so because he had this strong desire for literary fame, even though he didn't really want to do literary work, he got himself the prize. And you know, in New York City, in Washington, D.C., people had been gossiping, you know, did Kennedy really write that book? I wonder who really wrote that book. I wonder how much money they're getting out of those royalty checks. But then the Pulitzer changed the equation, and I think it made it a moral question and an ethical question. And Readers realized this too. When I was at the Kennedy Presidential Library, I looked at the letters that Kennedy was receiving in 1957, and librarians were sending him letters, school teachers were sending him letters saying, did you really write this book? And they were responding to that interview. Did you, you wouldn't have accepted that prize if you didn't write the book, would you? That, that's not the right thing to do. I mean, it was a moral question, and frankly, an easy question, but Kennedy and his family had an answer that was different than what those readers did. In the long arc of history, does it matter? Because uh, the book was all was being referenced during the recent impeachment debate. Mm -hmm. There's a Profiles in Courage award given out by the uh, Kennedy family and foundation uh, on an annual basis. So does it matter? Well, I think it matters in a very human and a very personal sense. Does it matter as much as what Kennedy did as president? Probably not. But if you want to know something about Kennedy, the human being, I think this is a wonderful chance to really see what his values were, um, what he was willing to do, and how he treated other people. Ted Sorensen is the person who did most of the work on the book. And one thing that Kennedy did write was the preface and the acknowledgments. And so in the preface and the acknowledgments, Kennedy wrote it and didn't even mention Sorensen's name. Sorensen gives it an edit because Sorensen was working on every single part of this book. And Sorensen said, you know, maybe you should mention me. So Kennedy added that mention back in. And then when the scandal came about, uh, Sorensen and Kennedy both would refer to the acknowledgments and say, everything's above board with this book. We, like, we mentioned right there that, that Ted did a little bit of work, but that this is Kennedy's book. But that credit only existed because Sorensen had to remind Kennedy, maybe you should give the person who actually wrote the book the credit. So. That's not, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis in terms of historical import, but it's a human choice. It's a, it's a human being who decided that this is how he wanted to act. And I think readers and, and voters, it's okay to think in those terms. It's okay to think of our presidents as humans and, and to evaluate them as, did they do the right thing as a person? There was a story much farther back in history uh, that was also over claims of authorship. Would you briefly tell the story of Eliza Hamilton? and uh, her claims uh, that her husband actually wrote George Washington's farewell address. It's, it's a crazy story and one of my favorite ones to tell in the book. This, this deals with the farewell address that we talked about. And as I said, it's you know the fact that it was Washington's speech, that's what mattered the most in that example. But Alexander Hamilton, he of course famously died in a duel and his reputation hit a little bit of a low point. And so his wife, who was very loyal to him, decided I need to prove that, that my husband was the one who wrote that speech to kind of give him help in recovering his historical reputation. And <clears throat> 
it, it's a crazy story. There was, it, it almost feels like a spy novel in, in the passages I write in my book. There was a bundle of secret documents that was sealed in wax, and Hamilton's supporters would pass it around. And these were people who were loyal to Hamilton. One of the people involved was actually his second in the duel with Burr, so somebody who really cared about Alexander Hamilton. But they cared about George Washington more. So Hamilton's children were trying to hunt this down. You know, one of his sons would go to the house and try to be nice and say, hey, why, why don't you turn over those documents? When that didn't work, a little bit later, the other son came along and was very menacing and, and tough. And that didn't work either. So it, it took a long time, but it was one of those stories where people were gossiping. How much of this is Hamilton? How much of this is Washington? And Washington had nothing to do with it himself. He was deceased at this point. Washington did not claim authorship for himself in the way that someone like Kennedy did. But, you know, it, it's an example that Americans have always loved gossiping about their presidents, even back in the 19th century. So John Kennedy's success seems to have, according to your book, inspired Richard Nixon to write his own, which was called what? Six Crises. And when did he publish that? 1963. We have a clip of Richard Nixon much farther in his lifetime talking about the process of writing. Let's watch that and come back and talk about him. Great. The first book I wrote was Six Crises. Uh, and I must say that this book, The Ninth, was my ninth crisis. Writing a book is very, very hard work. I know you interview people on your program. I've seen them on occasion. And I must say, I admire authors. Uh, I'm not saying that in terms of myself, but it, it is a great ordeal for me. I don't write easily. Uh, I see you've got some uh, yellow notes there. Or, I mean, notes on a yellow pad. I write outline after outline, then I dictate into a machine after I've done the whole thing so that it is the spoken word rather than the, the written word, as you know, is very uh, formal. But uh, and then I, I have good people that work with me, uh, but when, it, when I finally get down to, to uh, crafting the final product, uh, it is a great, great uh, burden ordeal for me. Let me ask you the same question. Every time I finish a book, I say never again. So let's start with six crises. What did it do for his political aspirations? Well, it was important because he had just lost that presidential election in 1960. And that's when Kennedy and he had a conversation after it. It was actually during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy asked Nixon to come to the White House so they could sort of talk through the issues. And when they were done, you know, Nixon could tell how tired Kennedy was. He really just, it, it was, a, it was a, a time that was weighing him down. But when they were done, um, Nixon mentioned that he was thinking about writing a book. And, and the topic perked Kennedy up. And he said, I think every politician should write a book. It can really help your uh, standing in the political realm. So that's what Nixon did. He worked on a book and it had, um, it covered different moments, different crises. It's similar in structure to George W. Bush's presidential memoir, Decision Points, in that it really picks key moments from that person's life. And it was a best-selling book. It was, um, it really helped him um, sort of begin to reestablish himself as a politician and begin that second act that, you know, eventually led him to become president. So after Watergate, he authored several more books. How did this uh, change, at, if it did, his reputation post-Watergate? Um, well, his presidential memoirs, which came out directly after Watergate, were a hugely anticipated book. It was, you know, there, it was breaking news when the page count of the book came out because people were like, well, this is how long the book is going to be. So there was intense ish interest because of that Watergate issue. After that, the books became a little um, less, less newsy in their topic. They were sort of more philosophical books more uh, books about governing philosophy and, and, and politics. And I think they helped, as much as anything else, um, President Nixon settle into that senior statesman role. It, it's still kind of amazing to think about his reputation after Watergate. And you know, if we're going to talk about human beings and, and people who make personal decisions, I think him and Watergate is a very revealing uh, episode as well. But he was able to sort of become the kind of person that you see in that clip, a kind of senior statesman whose views on international relations were, were valued and sought out by other presidents. And I think, you know, the, the regular rhythm of him releasing books had a lot to do with that. Thomas Jefferson, we're going to go back in history Let's again. Well-known lover of books. Mm -hmm. uh, his famous quote, I cannot live without books, is on pillows and other things and sure. coffee mugs and everywhere. And uh, people will remember that he ended up selling his collection of books to create the Library of Congress. How many books did he own, approximately? Uh, between 6,000 and 7,000 at that point. But then he started building a whole other collection and had a couple thousand more when he passed a few years later. So you credited him with the first campaign book. That's right. What was it? It was called Notes on the State of Virginia. And it wasn't a campaign book in the way that Abraham Lincoln's was, you know, with a candidate specifically pulling together a book with a run in mind. Um, the story started a little bit earlier for Jefferson. He worked on that book in the 1780s, and so it came out more than a decade before he ran for president. 
but it was essential. It was, it was a huge flashpoint during the elections of 1796 and especially 1800. This is when Jefferson and John Adams are running against each other. There were, there were other candidates as well. But to really understand why Notes on the State of Virginia was so important, I think we need to take a step back and, and talk about how campaigning worked in that time period. Today, when somebody runs for president, they want their name everywhere. They want to be on TV. They want to be on Twitter. They want to make their case directly to voters. But it was the complete opposite of that early in our history and for a long time in our history. If you were somebody who went out and said, I should be president, that was proof to most voters that you were not the right person to run for president. The idea was that you should be humble. You should be called to serve. It should be other people advocating for you and, and your ideas. And so most presidents just stayed at home and stayed quiet. There was a real public silence around John Adams, around Thomas Jefferson. But what that public silence did, that, that's a vacuum, right? Something needs to fill it. And that's where Notes on the State of Virginia came in. It was, a, it was a popular book. It's another book that if we adjust its sales totals to our own population, it sold the equivalent of half a million copies. So it, it was one of the most important books any American wrote in the 18th century. I'm, I'm not talking presidents. It was a vital book that really defended America to its European critics. So that book, people knew that book. People respected that book. And now that Jefferson was running for president but not saying much about it, they looked to his book for what he thought. We have a clip uh, from our archives of the well-known historian Roger Wilkins sure. talking about Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. Let's hear what he has to say and then come back to you. In the end, you have to believe that what he wrote in Notes on Virginia, um, his deep belief in black inferiority, he said in Notes on the state of Virginia that blacks are smelly, stupid, and uh, lazy and ugly. Um, he said it more elegantly, but uh, that was the gist of it. And, uh, and he, more than any of the other Virginia founders, um, seemed more unable to distance himself, even emotionally, from his ownership of slaves. So people wonder how the author of the Declaration of Independence can square his views on slaves and slave ownership. Uh, and I'm, you answer that to your own mind in the book. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it's, this is another example and, and, a, and a really troubling example of where going behind the scenes and, and looking at somebody sitting down to write can really reveal something about who they are as people. Um, in that book, Jefferson offers sort of bigger, broader comments about how slavery is a moral evil. But then, because he's Jefferson, he kind of slips into this sort of rational, scientific discourse and tries to explain, well, let's look at the difference between black Americans and white Americans. And his conclusions are exactly what we just saw. They're, they're troubling. They, they're written in a, in a way that makes them sound scientific, but that makes them read even worse, I think. That Jefferson was very frank that he thought that black people were inferior, and he thought that they were inferior not because of their circumstances, but just because that's who they were. And if anybody wants to give Jefferson a pass and think, well, oh, by the standards of his time, no. Because he showed drafts of this book to some of his contemporaries, and the first versions were worse. And they said, I, I don't agree with this. I don't think this is right. If you really believe slavery is a problem, you're not helping things, and you're not talking about them as human beings and in a way that is just. And so Jefferson softened it a little bit. He added sentences like, you know, this is only my hypothesis, but I mean, he wrote what he wrote, and he never changed his mind. As an old man, Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia was still a very popular book. One of the booksellers called it a standing book. You know, like today, you walk in, you're always going to see a few books in bookstores. In Jefferson's time, his book was that book. And printers would ask him, would you like to change anything in this book? He always said no. And I mean, that applies to those passages, those dehumanizing passages about black people as much as anything else in the book. One, one set of memoirs that is available in bookstores today still is Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs. Sure. Uh, what's the story of, of him writing that set of memoirs? It, it's almost an unbelievable story. Um, he was a wonderful writer. He, I think we sometimes forget that when he was a general, some of his orders that would go out at the battlefield were reprinted everywhere in newspapers. And they really introduced people to the, his literary style, which was concise and funny and very concrete. He was a tremendous writer. Um, but he didn't want to write a book. After his presidency, publisher after publisher said, you know, your book will be the biggest selling book of any Civil War figure. Will you do it? And he didn't want to. What changed his mind were two things. He went through a terrible bankruptcy 
and then he became very ill with what ultimately became a fatal form of cancer. And so he has these pressures. He doesn't have enough money. And I mean, he doesn't have enough money to pay his butcher. He has no money. And he is dying. He, it becomes difficult for him to even speak or swallow. But in those harrowing circumstances, he just got to work. And he worked so hard on his book. One thing I do in my book is reproduce a page from early in the process when he's first starting to write it because I think it just it puts you there with him in the writing. And you can see in his handwriting, he's crossing out words, he's stopping mid-sentence. He doesn't know what to say or how to write, but he just he gets momentum, he figures it out, and he realizes that he really cares about the writing. And he poured everything he had into that book. His family did. His wife supported him. His sons were fact-checking the book. They all worked as hard as they could. And although he passed away before the book came out, his publisher, who, by the way, was Mark Twain, uh, his publisher made it one of the biggest bestsellers in American history at that point. You have the scene of, it seems like, all of America waiting to see whether or not he would finish the book before he passed. Would you tell that story? Sure, absolutely. This is an example of how these books have been so central to American history. And, you know, we've forgotten about some of them today, but these books, in their own time periods, because of the publishing industry, because of the things we've talked about, they, they were news. They were at the core of what Americans were thinking about. And so Grant was working in his, on his book on his deathbed, the country knew that he was sick, the country knew that he was working on a book, and newspapers would have headlines like, General Grant went for a walk today. General Grant did not sleep well last night. General Grant managed to write three pages. And these are newspapers all over the country. There were telegraph lines that ran from houses close to his to other offices so the updates could happen, you know, in real time, at least by the standards of that time period. And the country was obsessed with it. And, and while this was happening, while he was racing to finish his book, there was an army of booksellers. A lot of them were Civil War veterans who were thrilled to have one last chance to, to celebrate the man they had served under. They were going door to door and they had a careful script. The first line of that script was, I'm here to talk to you about the book that you've heard so much about in the newspapers. This, this book was news. This was a book that every American was excited in and, and interested in. and um, Grant wrote a book that lived up to that to that anticipation. He needed to write it for Julia Grant because they had, he'd lost all his money, as I remember, and mm -hmm. bad investments with his son. How much money did Julia Grant make off of the book? It was, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars, and in, if, that, in that era, if so. you adjust, it was more than ten million dollars, and that's you know that's not a perfect adjustment, but you know a, a paycheck that was comparable to what President Clinton ended up earning from his book, or President George W. Bush earned for their books. That, that's an example of how popular these presidential books have always been, and it set his family up for life. But it. It seems not to have uh, the effect of burnishing his reputation. For a long time, presidential surveys, he was really pretty low, mm -hmm. coming up more recently. So what happened? Why did that not have the effect that he hoped it would? Be? It's a really curious fact, and, and I, I think it's a fact that would serve other presidential authors well to take note of. So Grant doesn't just write a good book, he writes a book that's a wild bestseller. So you would think those are the two criteria you would need to have a, a legacy book that could really shape a legacy. And yet, once Grant's book comes out, um, his reputation starts to stumble. Newspaper critics are saying, why aren't there more things about Ulysses S. Grant? Why aren't there more things telling his side? And the reason there wasn't is because the South did a much better job in the literary war than they had done in the actual Civil War. So there were lots of historians who were very pro-South, who wrote histories that celebrated the South. And one of their biggest strategies was to tear down Grant, to make Grant look like a butcher and a bad president and a drunk and then elevate Robert E. Lee as the sort of saintly and chivalrous figure. I always like to say that, that Grant sort of got granted himself because what helped him in the Civil War was that he had amazing resources. But in that literary war, it was the South with the amazing resources. And of course, Grant was a terrific general. The Southern historians were, were very calculating writers as well, and they just overwhelmed Grant's book. And so for decades, that book, um, it was a book that writers respected, it was a book that readers liked, but in terms of defining Grant as a president or a general, it didn't have the impact you would expect. It was only more recently when, when modern historians have gone back and re-examined things that they've, that they've seen Grant's true reputation. So if you're a president and you want to write a book that defends yourself, I think what history says is write a personal book instead. That if Ulysses S. Grant's book can't save his reputation, what hope do you have to write a book that's going to save your reputation? So don't worry about the political debates or the battlefield accounts. Tell a personal story. There have been some recent very successful Grant biographies published. Have they served to change his standing? Yeah, I think uh, the, the one that is really important is William McFeely's book, which came out a couple decades ago, but certainly um, Chernow's Grant 
and then a really important book um, by a professor named Joan Waugh, I, I think is one of the finest books about Grant written because it doesn't just tell the story of Grant, it tells the story of Grant's reputation at the same time. And it's, it's a wonderful book that I would highly recommend. Earlier you referenced Theodore Roosevelt as our most prolific writing president. Um, of him and Woodrow Wilson, you, who was our only president from the Academy, sure. uh, you say that their first books were their best. Why? It's a, I think, because they were young and passionate and they had a lot of energy, but I also think that they were, they were really thinking of themselves as writers at that time. And it's, you know, being a writer and being a politician aren't always the same approach and don't always require the same skills. A writer really looks for complexity and says, you know, what's the core of this problem? What's the, the backstory of this problem? A politician needs to simplify because a politician needs to get popular support. And so when Roosevelt and Wilson were working on their first books, they were really thinking as writers. Roosevelt started his first book actually while he was a student at Harvard. And he was obsessed with it. He would sit in class. The book was about the War of 1812, but in specific, it was about the naval side of that conflict. And Roosevelt would sit in class and just daydream about ships, British ships and American ships battling. It was all he could think about. He did incredible original research. He went to archives to find out plans of ships, sizes of ships, how many cannons ships had, which way those cannons were pointing, which matters more than just how many cannons there are. He would draw little diagrams to show the way the ships moved in battle. And all of that information helped him understand something important. And that's that patriotism and heroism aren't necessarily the best explanations for history. Um, an example in uh, Roosevelt's book is Oliver Perry, the famous admiral who won a battle and was celebrated so much in America that people were naming towns after him. People thought there was this incredible underdog victory, but when Roosevelt went back and used that raw research to see what kind of ships Perry had versus what kind of ships the British had, he found out that the reason Perry won that battle wasn't because he was so brave or heroic, though of course he was those things. It was, it was a simpler and more boring explanation. Perry had better ships. Now what's interesting is that once Roosevelt got closer to being a president himself, heroism, patriotism, those were the things that, that Roosevelt cared about. He sort of did a 180 as a writer and a thinker. So, uh, Wilson, mm -hmm. what's important with him in his study of, of Congress, and how did he use the, his study when he became president? Yeah, well, it's, it's again, the, the, the exact same trajectory where the first book is full of original research. Wilson's first book is, is still considered by scholars in political science today. It, it was an intellectual event when it came out um, in the 1880s. It, it was just a, a transformational book that really did a lot to shape the academic arguments over the next few decades. And it's interesting to note that his book is called Congressional Government, not Presidential Government. And that's because for a lot of the 18th century and the 19th century, Congress was really the seat of power. If you were a reporter who wanted to cover the action in Washington, you didn't go to the White House, you went to follow Congress. Congress was really where voters paid attention, where the media paid attention. And Wilson did, did a wonderful job sort of explaining why that was in his book and, and really explaining this is how America's system is set up and why it works that way. Of course, when he became president, he and Teddy Roosevelt were two of the presidents who did the most to make the modern presidency we know today. It's flipped. The president is the center of power. The president appeals to the people. The president defines the ideas and, and leads the parties. Wilson and Roosevelt were the ones to do more than anyone on that count. But, you know, Wilson kind of made his own book um, outdated because his book had talked about Congress and how powerful Congress was. But when Wilson was a president, he was able to sort of arrogate that power to the presidency. We now live in the age of blockbuster deals for presidents. The news reports are that the combined memoirs of the Obamas may have earned them as much as $65 million. When did the blockbuster era start? Sure. So it actually started in the 1980s. And that tells you as much about publishing as it tells you about um, the presidency. Part of it was that the presidency was becoming more glamorous and, and, and more celebrated. And Ronald Reagan, of course, was a president who did a lot to, to achieve that, especially with his background in Hollywood. But the publishing industry was changing in the same ways. If readers think about it, you know, Walden Books showing up in shopping malls, um, those kinds of changes made hardcover books able to sell millions of copies, not hundreds of thousands of copies. And so that uh, change 
helped editors start to look for certain kinds of books, books where the people came with a platform and an idea and a brand behind them, and, and that mattered as much as the book itself. And so in the 1980s, um, lots of lots of figures published best-selling books that were, were everywhere, and they would go on TV to talk about them. A really good example is actually Donald Trump, who, before he was a political candidate and a president, was one of those blockbuster authors with Art of the Deal. It was also the era when people who work in the White House began writing books. At that point, after they left, now we're seeing in midstream. Right. Uh, how has that impacted the study of the presidency? Well, it's 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 unbelievable how much things sped up in the 1980s. The, things changed so quickly that people who left the Reagan administration, sort of midstream, were publishing their books before people in the Carter administration had published their books. So they were they were literally leapfrogging the, the administration before them, because publishers and and political figures were seeing that there was a lot of money to be made in this, and so. I honestly don't know that we've quite come to terms with, with what these changes have meant even today. You can see that with um, John Bolton's book, which isn't out yet, but has already been widely discussed. And it's, it's going to be a blockbuster. There's no question about it. But there are certainly ethical and moral questions about should that information have been in a book? Should it have been presented in other formats? And those questions don't have answers yet because we're still sort of in the middle of this, this big change, both in politics and in publishing. Do publishers actually make money off of these books? They do. They did not for a while. Um, Ronald Reagan's uh, presidential memoirs, he got an advance of around $7 million, and they lost quite a bit of money on that one. Um, but since about 2000 or so, they've publishing has, has sort of figured this out. You mentioned the Obama's advance, which is astronomical, but Michelle Obama's book is one of the best-selling books in American history at this point. And I have to believe that, that President Obama's book will, will do equally well or perhaps even better. So publishers have started to realize that, that, that they can sell these books in a certain way. And blockbuster publishing is working for them, which is why I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. You mentioned Donald Trump's Art of the Deal. We have a clip from Peter Osnos, who appears uh, in your modern section several times sure. for publishing presidential memoirs. And this is him telling the story of signing the book, The Art of the Deal. Sure. Let's listen. In one of the very, very few times that Cy Newhouse ever intervened at Random House, he said, we're going to do a book with this fellow. I had arrived at Random House with the mandate of doing books of this kind, biographies of high-profile figures. So I was, I, I like to put it, tasked. I went to see Trump with, with Cy and our then publisher, Howard Kaminsky. What I did was I took a big Russian novel that I had. Generations of Winter, wrapped black and gold paper around it, put Trump's name on it, and brought it to the to Trump Tower and showed it to him and said, this could be you. And lo and behold, he agreed. Actually, he wanted the Trump name slightly larger. How significant was the art of the deal in President Trump's quest for the White House? I think it was really significant. It's, you know, it wasn't Twitter that made him a national figure. It wasn't a TV show. It was that book because it was a blockbuster. It really lifted him from being a New York City figure to being a national figure. That book came out, sold more than a million copies, but also uh, Trump went on TV again and again and promoted it, talked about it, told stories from it. And it really defined a style and defined an image that, that he still used when he ran for president so many years later. We should tell people that Peter Osnos is, plays a role in C-SPAN's corporate history. Later on, he went to, to on to find, they found his own nonfiction publishing house called Public Affairs Press, and they have brought our C-SPAN books to market, so I want to get that on the record. But interestingly, in his history, he brought both The Art of the Deal and Barack Obama's Dreams from My Father to market. It, it's it's hard to hard to wrap your head around yeah, that, isn't it? What does that it? say about the publishing business? Well, it says that the publishing business publishes lots of different kinds of books, and that's one of the things I think that, that we should celebrate about it. Um, the story with Dreams from My Father is itself a really interesting story because Peter Osnos was the, was the person who signed the deal, but that was actually Obama's second deal because the book was so challenging for him to write. I think today we think about Obama as such a polished um, person and speaker and presidential candidate. He's got this life story, you know, the father from Kenya, the mother from Kansas. It all just clicks together and, and his background sort of explains how people can come together. Um, it's a great story. It's one thing that helped him, I think, become president. But it, it wasn't an easy story to piece together. It was really in writing his first book, and, and he's talked about this in interviews. It was in writing that book that he was able to piece those stories together. And it, it wasn't a simple process. He got the book deal. He wrote part of the book. He sent it in. The pub his first publisher did not like it. They ended up, he got married in October to Michelle. 
a, a couple weeks later, he lost his book deal. So Obama, as a young man, as somebody with a lot of law school debt, finds that he doesn't have a book deal anymore, except it's worse than that. He owes his publisher part of the advance that he's already spent. And so he had a very, very good agent, and she was able to get him the second deal with, uh, with Peter Osnos. And I, I interviewed Mr. Osnos, and he talked about having Obama come to their offices because he wanted to meet with him, and he wanted to say, you know, is this guy going to finish the book this time before I, I give him another advance? And Osnos just said he was impressed that Obama came in and, and he knew what he wanted to be the book about. And so once he was able to figure those themes out, and it took a lot of reading, it took a lot of revising, it took a, a really good editor who helped him, Obama put that book together. And in that book, there were the themes that would show up in his convention speech and show up in his presidential campaign. The writing of that book, I think, helped Obama sort of understand his own life and, and his future political appeal. How important are narratives to a political success? Did you see other presidents who developed life narratives that they used then on the campaign trail? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you can tell your life story in a way that connects not just to who you are, but the ideas and the issues that you stand up for, it's really effective because readers have multiple ways to respond to it and, and to remember it. Calvin Coolidge is actually a great example. His literary style was very clipped, very concise, surprisingly funny, um, and it lined up with his image. He, he was known as Silent Cal, even though he had two fantastic books. So really, he's somebody we should remember for his words as much as for his the absence of his words. But that sort of um, stern, button-down, serious approach lined up very much with his politics and his sort of traditional approach to American life. The st literary style of Calvin Coolidge lined up with the life of Calvin Coolidge, and readers and voters responded to both things. We have President Obama talking all the way back in 1985 about writing dreams. Let's put that on as we get close to our end here. Sure. My father was a black African, and my mother uh, was a, a white American. And much of my life was spent trying to reconcile the terms of my birth, uh, that divided heritage, with the realities of race and nationality, uh, tribal identities uh, that exist not just in this country, but also overseas. Uh, so that this book is not so much a memoir, I think, as, as sort of a, a journey of discovery for me, some sense of trying to make sense of my family. What do you see there? Well, I see exactly what I was talking about. It's, it's the father from Kenya, the mother from Kansas, those lines that show up in that famous convention speech and showed up when he ran in 2008. Um, somebody on Hillary Clinton's campaign that year said, we're not running against a person, we're running against a story. And, and that's what gave his campaign momentum. But you can see right there in 1995, he had finally figured that story out. After years of writing, after years of reading, after years of thinking, he solved that story, figured out that story, and that's what supercharged his political appeal and, and, and some of the ideas that he stood for. We're almost uh, up a, a time in our hour with you, but uh, in a, a review in the Washington Examiner, um, Philip Ter Terzian was critical of the fact that you didn't include one very prolific diarist, and that's James K. Polk. Mm -hmm. How did he end up on your cutting room floor? Well, first of all, a diary is not a book. And I, I relied on presidential diaries often. John Quincy Adams wrote wonderful diaries. James Garfield wrote wonderful diaries. Um, from Garfield's diaries, we actually know that he was reading um, and talking about Civil War books like Grant's, like Sherman's. So diaries are good sources. But what I wanted my book to do was I wanted it to tell a real story and to be a coherent book. And so to do that, I, I had to make cuts. There have been a lot of presidents, and they've written a lot of things. But what interested me was the story of their books and how important those books have been to American history. So I focused on their books, and I focused on their reading. I focused on presidents reading other presidents. And so when I made those kinds of choices, that let me tell the best stories. Uh, no offense to Polk, but his story is, is not one of the best stories. And so I didn't want to waste pages on it. So having spent 10 years with presidential books, I can ask this question two ways. Do you have a favorite? Or if people haven't spent much time with them, where's a good place to start? I really like Calvin Coolidge's autobiography. Uh, it came out in 1929. I don't believe it's in print anymore, although somebody should really change that. Um, but it's a wonderfully personal book. We talked earlier about Ulysses S. Grant's book and how even though it has incredible details and it, it is really rich in history, it didn't do much to shape his legacy. And so many presidents have sort of followed that approach. I, I've got to list every fight that I got in. I've got to say why I was right in every single one of those fights. 
Calvin Coolidge didn't do that. His book is about a sixth as long as Grant's, so it's a really slim volume, and it's just a wonderfully personal volume. The example that sticks out to me, and, and the example that made it such a, such a celebrated book in 1929, the year it came out, centers on Calvin Coolidge's son. Uh, Calvin Coolidge's son died while he was in the White House, developed a blister um, while playing on the White House lawn, and you know, in an era before antibiotics, that blister became infected and killed him. And so Americans knew that story because they, they knew the White House and they followed along Long. They listened to Calvin Jr.'s um, funeral on the radio. But once the book came out, Calvin Coolidge was able to tell his side of the story. And what he told was, I was the most powerful person in America, and I had no power to save my son who was dying right in front of me. And that any parent, any child can relate to that story. That's a story of the presidency, but it's also a story of being a human being. And that's what Coolidge did in his brief and, and really wonderfully written book. He told those personal stories. He said, this is what it felt like to be president. And I think that's what our presidents should do in their books. I think that's what I tried to do in my book, is show that personal side. And if more presidents look to Coolidge as, as a literary model, I think we'd be better off as readers. The book is called Authors in Chief, Craig Furman's first book, Thank you for spending an hour with C-SPAN. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. All Q&A programs are available on our website or as a podcast at cspan.org. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A podcast. We'll spend the next several weeks dipping into our archives, sharing some of our best episodes. And Q&A will be back in January with new episodes. So be sure to follow this feed so you never miss an episode.